Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, in a stunning move, First Lady Tammy Murphy drops out of the U.S. Senate race, clearing a path for Andy Kim to lock up the Democratic nomination. I don't know if I, if I ever imagined we would get to this point where we'd see, you know, such uh, a desire across our entire state for change. Plus, as the Senate shakeup plays out, it's deadline day for all other congressional candidates seeking a spot on the state's June primary ballot. A lot of these races have been building up um, and they haven't gotten an awful lot of attention just because of all the attention that was paid to the Senate race. Also, a survivor-centered database. The state is creating a new system aimed at helping sexual assault survivors track and monitor their own cases. This opportunity to use federal funding to build this database is going to be transformative for New Jersey for sure. And this weekend storm brought record rainfall for parts of the state, leaving low-lying neighborhoods underwater. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. First Lady Tammy Murphy is out of the race for U.S. Senate, abruptly ending her bid for the Democratic nomination in a video released on social media yesterday. It's a stunning development in what's become one of the most watched races in the nation and all but clears the way for Congressman Andy Kim to become the presumptive nominee in the general election. In her video, Murphy said it became clear to her that continuing the race would involve waging a, quote, divisive and negative campaign that would tear down a fellow Democrat at a time when the presidency and Donald Trump are on the ticket. But her campaign faced an uphill battle from the start, further blown off course by a major lawsuit filed by Kim to dismantle the party line system Murphy benefited from. And even though her candidacy is dead, that lawsuit is still very much alive, according to Kim. The turn of events is a game changer in the race, as senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. After many busy, invigorating, and yes, challenging months, I am suspending my Senate campaign today. In a lot of ways, this campaign was doomed from the start, and that's not entirely the candidate's fault. The First Lady's team probably did bungle their launch a bit, looking to the party bosses for approval before working on their message to voters. They also never counted on Congressman Andy Kim catching fire as a candidate or the tear down the line movement that could change the course of elections in the state forever. There's definitely a recalibration on where the voice that matters is, that it can't be just party chair people and that it actually is the grassroots and the voters. I think that's healthy. Um, you know, you, you've had a system here where a handful of people influence every decision and it impacts costs to residents in New Jersey. It's why we're a very expensive place to live. It impacts legislation in Trenton. Um, and that is ripe for change. Jersey City Mayor Steve Fulop, a candidate for governor, gave voice to many who were silently dreading their support of a boss-driven campaign that was having a serious case of failure to launch. And then there was the unassuming three-term congressman from South Jersey. Andy Kim is a once-in-a-generation candidate to help bring about that culture change. To see that culture change coming and to step into it and to help bring it about, right, says a lot about him. But you're right. She didn't see any of that happening when she walked into the race. I mean, she sort of stepped into a minefield and he saw things that were stacked against him and he wasn't willing to take no for an answer. He figured out a way around it. And uh, and so he changed he changed the rules on the way. You know, you know, I mean, in a sense, he changed the game. I don't know if I, if I ever imagined we would get to this point where we'd see, you know, such uh, a desire across our entire state for change and to be able to push in that direction. So this is really exciting. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than 
our Senate race. There have been people, advocates, activists that have been working in this space for years. So, you know, I'm just grateful for everybody else uh, and the work that they're doing. And I'm, I'm proud to be part of this operation, a part of this effort. Murphy says she's going to concentrate her efforts over the next several months, helping the Biden presidential campaign. She wasn't talking today, but Kim said he and Murphy spoke briefly before her announcement over the weekend, but she didn't offer, nor did Kim ask for, an endorsement. With Murphy out, the conventional wisdom is that Kim is all but the presumptive nominee, which the other two candidates still in the race say is, well, presumptuous. Now this is an opportunity to turn the leaf and actually talk about what Andy Kim is for. He's so far been saying what he's against. He's against uh, uh, Menendez. He's against Tammy Murphy. He has not told New Jersey voters what he is about. And this is an opportunity now for New Jersey voters to talk about his vision for New Jersey. And I will continue in this race because I have been from the beginning talking about my vision for New Jersey and what I will do to fight for New Jersey working families. The Kim Murphy fight was to me, now this is Larry Ham speaking, was to me a clubhouse fight. I mean, Andy Kim, he's an incumbent congressman. He's not Larry Ham. He's not Patricia Campos Medina. He's part of the establishment. You know, he might not want to be classified as part of the establishment, but he is part of the establishment. So while the Kim Murphy battle may be over, the actual race for the Senate nomination with issues and voting records coming to the fore may have just begun. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. The First Lady wasn't the only U.S. Senate candidate to drop out of the primary. GOP contender and former News 12 New Jersey reporter Alex Zidane also announced today he's dropping his bid. That leaves Republican entrepreneur Curtis Bashaw and Menda Mayor Christine Serrano-Glasner left to fight for that nomination. Anyone else looking to get on the June primary ballot had until 4 p.m. today to file, showing they have the required signatures to secure a spot. That applies to Senate and congressional hopefuls all the way down to the local level. For more on where things stand, I'm joined by senior writer Colleen O'Day. Colleen, what a day. Uh, truly remarkable in the political landscape. Uh, so far, from everything we know about the filing, any surprises that we weren't expecting in terms of candidates? Well, other than this Senate surprise, um, not, not really. You know, we a lot of these races have been building up um, and they haven't gotten an awful lot of attention just because of all the attention that was paid to the Senate race and, you know, in particular on the Democratic side. But we're still going to have a Senate race in both the Democratic and Republican primaries. Yeah, we've been talking a lot, of course, about the front runners in the U.S. Senate uh, primary. Were there any names added to that list that haven't been uh, in the mix up until this point? Yes, yeah, so we've there is a, a Republican who we haven't heard about before, Peter Valrosi. He's from Sussex County, from Newton, and he is running as a conservative Republican. Um, you know what kind of chances he has without having any kind of party backing. You know, as we know all about the party line, um, you know that's really unclear. But um, so he would be the third Republican in the race. So this is obviously procedural. You have to get the filing in. You have to show that you had the signatures. But what happens next? Because we have seen races fall apart in years past um, when other candidates and people outside of uh, the candidacy have filed challenges to those petitions. Right. So that's going to be happening over the next week. Um, for the Senate, you need a thousand signatures. Uh, for the House, you really only need 200 signatures, which is not a hugely high bar, but there are some candidates who came in with just a, a little more than 200. And yes, we have seen in the past, and certainly I, I would expect it will happen this year, that some folks um, may have signatures that wind up being uh, unvalidated. And so then those folks uh, by April 3rd will know who winds up not making it onto the ballot. Yeah, what's the next big date we need to be looking at? Obviously, the April 3rd date, um, but we're just two months out from the June primary. What's next on your calendar that you're keeping tabs of? Yeah, it's, it's really not that far away. Um, 
we at the end of the month, uh, candidates have to file their next reports with the FEC quarterly reports. So those come out usually by mid April. Those would be public. Um, so we'll certainly be looking and seeing how the, the money race is is shaking out. You know, we had seen some surprises in the 8th district where Rob Menendez, the senator's son, is the incumbent and is facing a challenge from the Hoboken mayor, Robbie Bala, who had raised more money than him. He was raised almost a million dollars. Um, you know, and money can really matter in these races. So, um, you know, money could be important also in a race like in the ninth, where you have Bill Pascrell, one of the oldest members of Congress and a long serving congressman, a Democrat, facing a challenge from the mayor of Prospect Park, he filed a petition with more than a thousand signatures, which is a healthy number. So I would think he's going to stay on the ballot. Yeah. You know, we're also still waiting for this decision from a judge about uh, abolishing the county party line on the ballot. How much could that affect uh, these races going forward? And the fact that, you know, Andy Kim, the presumptive Democratic nominee at this point, um, has accepted the line now from the party chairs who previously didn't endorse him when Tammy Murphy was in the race. You know, that, that's it's really such a, a hard thing to, to talk about in that respect, because Kim obviously knows that the party line is very um, influential. It really can help him. He's, of course, been arguing against it. So now we're hearing that the counties that endorsed Tammy Murphy are just going to give the line to Kim. That certainly seems like an undemocratic process. But overall, I would think that, you know, particularly in some of the House races, the line is abolished and no one has the line. That could possibly change the face of some races. Colleen O'Day for us. Colleen, thanks so much. Thank you, Bree. Meanwhile, the gears keep turning in Trenton with budget hearings underway. This week, key executive branch officials are testifying before the legislature, starting with the state treasurer today, who faced tough questions about how the Murphy administration plans to spend more than the state will take in during the next fiscal year. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports. The governor has outlined his proposed budget for his fiscal year 2025, and now it's our responsibility as a legislature to have a robust overview of it. The Assembly Budget Committee got to ask some hard questions about the governor's proposed budget during a hearing today where they heard testimony from the Office of Legislative Services and directly from State Treasurer Elizabeth Mayor Moyo, who highlighted key funding efforts for the next fiscal year. Being the first to fully fund the K-12 school funding formula. The proposed increase of $908 million in formula aid brings the total investment to $11.7 billion. And Governor Murphy fully funding the pension payment, a $7.1 billion investment. Would bring Governor Murphy's total pension contributions to $39.9 billion, more than triple the total contributions made by the previous six administrations combined. Moyo also highlighted property tax rebate programs like Anchor and Stay NJ, a property tax freeze for seniors who remain in the state, all while keeping a surplus in the budget. When Governor Murphy first took office six years ago, we inherited a budget that included a surplus of less than 2% and one that allocated a small fraction of the required pension payment. Even though this budget does have a $6.1 billion surplus, it doesn't meet the recommended 12% surplus that states should have, according to the Office of Legislative Services, and that topic took up much of the discussion today. The end of the road for the current financial trajectory is looming on the horizon. The anticipated $6.1 billion FY25 closing surplus would represent only about 11.1% of total recommended FY25 expenditures from the general fund and the property tax relief fund. The last th budgets have had a structural deficit of you're spending more than you're bringing in, which is a that's a, what, how you define a structural deficit. If we continued in this manner, and indications are that we may do that, mm -hmm. would, would you agree that in a two years we would be in a financial crisis? If we didn't take more efficiencies, if, if we took no more cuts to the budget. As I said, we, we put a billion dollars in cuts in this budget. Assemblywoman Carol Murphy questioned the treasurer on one of those cuts, 20 million to community colleges. Could you just talk a little bit how we can justify that $20 million cut to our community colleges 
um, especially when we are still dealing with affordability issues. I think overall in higher ed funding, we've got 3.144 billion this budget proposes. We've heard many, dis, you know, remarks already today about the issue of the structural deficit that we have to address and everything else that kind of goes into putting these numbers together. Uh, this is one of, you know, another one of those tough decisions. Another major topic was the corporate transit fee, a proposal that could raise nearly $1 billion for NJ Transit, but so far no bill has been introduced to guide how that money would be spent. How of the billion dollars that we collect in this upcoming budget, are we, how are we helping transit in this upcoming year, and are we going to find ourselves in out years in difficulty with the fact that we didn't allocate this money towards transit? For the corporate transit fee, a lot will depend on the legislative language that we work on together. And a lot will depend on how the legislature works with Treasury to iron out the details of what actually remains in this proposed budget. In Trenton, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Governor Murphy on Friday took the first step in making sure the state is better prepared for a future public health crisis, signing an executive order creating the Task Force on Pandemic and Emergency Preparedness. It comes after a nearly 1,000-page independent review was released on New Jersey's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and cited systemic failures that cost tens of thousands of residents' lives throughout the outbreak. The task force will be co-chaired by the State Department of Health Commissioner Caitlin Bastin and State Police Colonel Patrick Callahan. It'll also include other senior officials from across state government. The COVID report warned New Jersey is still underprepared for the next emergency, but offered 33 recommendations the state could act on to improve future actions. In a recent radio interview, Governor Murphy pledged to implement those recommendations during his final two years in office. Well, by this time next year, if all goes according to plan, survivors of sexual abuse will be able to more easily track their cases and monitor the status of their forensic exam kits. That's the DNA samples like hair, blood and urine collected after an assault is reported. It's all thanks to a new database that will be rolled out through New Jersey's Division of Violence Intervention and Victim Assistance. That's important, according to advocates, because the current process of following a case can be re-traumatizing. It often requires calling labs and law enforcement and rehashing details of the incident. For more of those details on the program, I'm joined by the division's executive director, Patricia Teffenhart. Patricia, thanks for coming on the show. You've called this a survivor-centered database. How will it work? There are really two main components to what we'll be putting in place through the securing of these federal funds. The first part of this is creating a statewide database that will allow us to track in real time the collection, the tracking, the status updates of all the forensic evidence that we collect when a survivor of sexual assault engages through a forensic medical exam. So historically, it's just been a challenging process to keep all of that data in real time. It's hard for us to keep track of trends. We can't create data-driven policy decisions because getting the data has been so cumbersome. So this new tracking system will allow us to have access to that data on a statewide level in real time. And that should really transform how quickly we can make pivots when it comes to policy and practice reform. Yeah, because, the second, yeah, go oh, on. No, no, go so on. This, the second most important piece, I think, really is the fact that survivors will have access to this data as well. And so when a survivor engages in a forensic medical exam, they'll receive a personalized access code where they can log into this portal and in real time track the status of their evidence, which will then give them more autonomy, more access to information without having to place phone calls during business hours, and really reduce the amount of trauma that they experience as they're now navigating this process. Is it more likely that folks will have faith in the system that if they do decide to come forward, it will be seen uh, through to the end and therefore maybe give us a more accurate depiction of how many of these incidents are happening? Brianna, you're asking all the right questions and that is our hope. I mean, you're right. We know that sexual assault is the most underreported crime. So anything that we can do to affirm survivors' confidence in the criminal justice system and our ability to not just um, hold offenders accountable, but also to treat them in survivor-centered, trauma-informed ways helps us get to a place where 
we can have a more healing pathway forward after someone experiences victimization. Is the state, from what you can share with us, committed to going even further with the reforms? Um, and can you give us any sense about how many untested kits still remain? Yeah, so that's a really great question, and I'm glad you asked it the way you did. There's a lot of um, confusion around what it means to be an untested kit versus, I think, what has been more popularly talked about at the national level, like a backlog. So in New Jersey, we have really survivor-centered policies. And in fact, Attorney General Platkin issued a directive in March of last year that expanded the amount of time New Jersey will hold on to a sexual assault forensic exam kit to 20 years, which does bring us in line with national best practice standards. And so that means that a survivor could have that critical, those critical specimens collected today and then have 20 years from that point in time to make decisions as to whether or not they'd like to move forward through the criminal justice system and have that kit move forward to law enforcement possession and maybe move forward to the lab. And so those kits that we hold are untested kits. Um, and then in New Jersey, we've been really taking a look at that data that I told you has been historically really hard for us to get a hold of. And what we've been able to determine is that our prosecutors have the ability to call the state lab and say, we have a case that's moving forward really quickly. Can you process those specimens immediately? And if you look at the data that we've been able to collect so far, we see that some kits have been tested in as quickly as 24 hours when they're needed to help move a criminal justice proceeding forward. But the data that we'll be collecting now in real time will absolutely give us other opportunities to change policies and practices that could be even more transformative for survivors and actually help us with the criminal justice process as well. Patricia Teffenhardt is the executive director of the New Jersey Division of Violence Intervention, Intervention and Victim Assistance. Patricia, thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. In our spotlight on Business Report, it may be two years away, but New Jersey isn't wasting time preparing to host the 2026 World Cup Final. Representatives from the host committee, New Jersey Transit, and tourism and business groups recently revealed some of the work that will take place before the big event, including major construction. We're talking seven new buildings around MetLife Stadium, widening the soccer pitch to meet FIFA standards, and moving the existing perimeter of the stadium to create room for fan experiences. New Jersey was also tapped to host eight matches throughout the World Cup tournament, and business leaders are looking to capitalize on fan events and experiences leading up to it. Notably, by making sure New Jersey Transit is equipped, they don't want another Super Bowl embarrassment. The rail agency will split the transportation burden between the existing Meadowlands rail line and a new Transitway bus rapid transit project that's currently under design. Early predictions estimate the World Cup will have a $2 billion impact on the economy here with more than 14,000 jobs created. How do you grow the game and not look at New York, New Jersey as the foundation for the game with that diversity? Yeah. So the whole hello world uh, mantra is something that um, we're delighted that the press picked up on. And um, this was a real great moment for our region. Uh, I shared over and over again, this doesn't get done with everybody who works and, and lives and participates in this region in some capacity. On Wall Street, the stock rally dipped to start this shortened trading week. Here's how the markets closed. Coastal flood warnings and advisories were still in effect for most of the day across the state after that soaking rainstorm over the weekend. The National Weather Service says parts of New Jersey recorded four inches of total rainfall, while most counties got at least one to two. The highest totals were in far corners of the state, four inches in Lower Alloway's Creek, Salem County, and almost as much in Sewell. Lindhurst in Bergen County got more than three and a half. The bulk of the highest rainfall totals appeared to slam southeast New Jersey, and that caused excessive runoff and flooding in dozens of towns. In Nutley, an entire park 
truck was underwater. The roadways in Newark and other low-lying neighborhoods fell victim to Saturday's drenching. The National Weather Service says the storm also brought strong winds with gusts as high as 50 miles per hour along the shore, and they stretched into the 40-mile-per-hour range inland, too. That does it for us tonight, but don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group has been part of New Jersey for over a century. We support our communities through NJM's corporate giving program, supporting arts and culture related and nonprofit organizations that serve to improve the lives of children, rebuild communities, and help to create a new generation of safe drivers. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Thank you.